There we go. Let's begin again. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Duff, the Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It is my honor to welcome you to our virtual platform for today's lecture. The Society was founded in 1974 by then Chief Justice Warren Berger to improve public understanding about the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the judiciary. One of the elements the Society has utilized to educate the public has been our lectures on the court's history and its justices. Beginning at the uh, start of the COVID pandemic, we've utilized Zoom for our lectures, and we will be continuing these virtual lectures even as we move toward a return to in-person programming as well. If you've missed an earlier program, please visit the Society's YouTube page to watch them. We think you will enjoy them. Today's lecture is in honor of DC Emancipation Day, which was yesterday. The DC Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862 ended slavery in Washington, DC, freed 3,100 individuals, reimbursed those who had legally owned them and offered the newly freed women, uh, women and men money to emigrate. This legislation, and the courage and struggle of those who fought to make it a reality is commemorated by Washington, D.C. every April. Our speaker today is extremely well qualified to share her insights on the abolitionist origins of Civil War constitutionalism and emancipation. Manisha Sinha is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut and a leading authority on the history of slavery and abolition and the Civil War and Reconstruction. She was born in India and received her PhD from Columbia University, where her dissertation was nominated for the Bancroft Prize. She is the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina. Her second monograph, The Slave's Cause, a History of Abolition was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships, including the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship in 2022. She is the eighth recipient of the James W.C. Pennington Award for 2021 from the University of Heidelberg, Germany. In 2018, she was visiting professor at the University of Paris, Diderot, and in 2003, she was appointed the, uh, to the Distinguished Lecture Series of the Organization of American Historians. She is a member of the Advisory Council of the American Civil War Museum and the Council of Advisors of the Lapidus Center of, for the Historical Analysis of Transatlantic and Atlantic Slavery at the Schomburg New York Public Library. She is co-editor of the uh, Race in the Atlantic series of the University of Georgia Press and on the editorial board of the journal Slavery and Abolition. She's taught at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for over 20 years, where she was awarded the Chancellor's Medal, the highest recognition, recognition bestowed on faculty. Her latest book, The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic, a Long History of Reconstruction, 1860 to 1900, is forthcoming from Liberite. She has written in numerous publications, and we could spend much of the rest of this hour discussing uh, Professor Sinha's accomplishments, but then there would not be time for this uh, wonderful lecture and her insights into emancipation and slavery. Professor, welcome. The Society's virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, for that generous introduction. And I am very happy to be here. Um, I am going to start um, sharing my screen with you before I uh, begin my lecture today. Um, I am happy to talk about the long abolitionist roots of, um, of emancipation. And, and changes to the constitution that occurred during the Civil War and Reconstruction. 
Um, and I think it's only appropriate that we talk about that, well, maybe a day after uh, Emancipation Day, but nonetheless, uh, a very important day uh, to mark in American history. Um, so let's begin by uh, talking about the roots, the abolitionist roots of anti-slavery constitutionalism, uh, which was really carried forth by the Republican Party. And I'm talking, of course, about the 19th century Republican Party, uh, the party of anti-slavery and Abraham Lincoln, of big government and of uh, racial liberalism. Now, on the eve of the Civil War, when the political success of the Republican Party in the North seemed imminent, most abolitionists felt that they and free soilers, those are people who advocated the non-extension of slavery into Western territories, were part of a grand anti-slavery political coalition. The relationship between the abolition movement and political anti-slavery in the antebellum North was intimate and symbiotic, but they were not one and the same. Writing about the revolutionary era, the great historian of slavery, David Bryan Davis contended that abolition was, quote, the most activist expression of anti-slavery. From the creation of the American Republic to the sexual controversies over abolitionist petitions, fugitive slaves, the extension of slavery, abolition and political anti-slavery were allied. Not only did the roots of Civil War constitutionalism lie in abolition, but radical free soilers were either political abolitionists themselves or had close ties to the abolition movement. So if we were to draw a Venn diagram to represent abolition as a social movement and free soil political parties, radical Republicans would inhabit the middle of two overlapping circles. This anti-slavery platform, call it Freedom National, a la Charles Sumner, or the denationalization of slavery, like Salmon P. Chase, was not abolition, but it could lead or pave the way to abolition. So this was an idea that we must completely divorce the federal government from slavery. Most abolitionists understood that, as did most Southern slaveholders, who viewed free soilism as an existential threat and used the election of Abraham Lincoln on that platform as good reason to secede from the Union, at least most of the Deep South states that seceded immediately after the election of Lincoln. We cannot, however, collapse abolitionism into the Republican Party, the anti-slavery Republican Party of the 19th century or vice versa. The politics of abolition, like its constituency, was multifaceted, diverse, and contentious. No one slogan or program can encapsulate it, except perhaps human rights, a term that abolitionists first popularized. So abolitionists' rich debates over the nature of the United States Constitution and the use of law and state action to not just destroy slavery, but also establish African-American citizenship had fed into that outcome. So if anti-slavery constitutional theory was the vehicle through which Republican politicians in the 19th century pushed the abolitionist agenda, its abolitionist roots deserve more attention. Now, before the Civil War, sectional compromises and the desire to preserve the Union and reverence for the constitutional compact between the states thwarted abolitionist aims. The Constitution, Northern Emancipation Laws that were passed during the Revolutionary Era, and anti-slavery jurisprudence were not sufficient in and of themselves to establish the freedom principle in the North and to challenge the extraterritoriality for the laws of slavery claimed by slaveholders. Behind every landmark anti-slavery judicial decision, starting with the famous Somerset case in 1772 in Britain, to the infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857, which of course famously said 
the Supreme Court famously said that a black man had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. Um, behind each of these decisions lay an enslaved litigant and abolitionist lawyers. So abolition is not a sideshow when it comes to politics or even mainstream jurisprudence. They're very much involved in these debates. Now, the rise of interracial immediatism, which is the radical abolition movement demanding immediate abolition without compensation to slaveholders. They said if anyone deserves compensation, it was the enslaved uh, for generations of servitude and without colonization, that is no colonizing free black people back uh, to Africa, all the features that were there in fact in the DC Emancipation Bill, this interracial immediatism involved the rejection of anti-slavery gradualism and colonization. And the adoption of moral suasion as a tactic never led to the abandonment of political and legal strategies. Abolitionists combined radical rhetoric with circumspect means, reviving early abolitionist petition campaigns for abolition in the District of Columbia, because that was directly under the control of the federal government and against the admission of new slave states. Yet they were frequently the target of mob violence, North and South, as fanatics who threatened the Union and the Constitution. The lessons of the 1830s made William Lloyd Garrison and his followers move towards non-resistance, which was a radical theory that rejected the use of force by the state. It was a radical critique of both the state and the church and towards women's rights. Garrison's political critics within the abolition movement sought to purge it of his heresies that threatened to make abolition even more unpopular. But far from being an extremist minority, abolitionism had an impact on the national political arena, leading John C. Calhoun's political lieutenants to make respectful inquiries of James Burney, Secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, on the exact strength of its affiliates' memberships. And this was in the 1830s. Calhoun is already perceiving abolition as a threat to slaveholders. He's the preeminent pro-slavery spokesman, senator from South Carolina, uh, vice president of Andrew ja Jackson before he leaves during the nullification crisis. Um, he is extremely aware of the political threat posed by this northern radical minority. Now, the anti-slavery committee of Joshua Levitt and Theodore Weld, pictured here on the left, as well as the work of other abolitionists like Benjamin Lundy and David D. Child, alerted anti-slavery politicians to slaveholders, quote, atrocious plot to annex Texas and fed them abolitionist speeches um, and research. In 1838, Weld published quote, the power of Congress over the District of Columbia, in which he argued that the constitutional power of the federal government to legislate for the district was so clear, quote, that it defies misconstruction. And in fact, Calhoun and Southerners were saying that the federal government had no right to legislate over slavery, either in the district or the federal territories. An idea, of course, that the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court also accepted. Weld also researched, quote, the rights of colored citizens under the US Constitution, insisting like most abolitionists that the Constitution's equal privileges and immunities clause applied to free African-Americans who were citizens of the Northern states. Abolitionist ideas made some headway when federal courts held that Southern states' Negro seamen laws, which imprisoned all free black seamen visiting Southern ports, violated the Constitution and American treaties with foreign powers. The next year, the abolitionist judge William Jay, pictured here on your right, explicitly connected the powers of the federal government with black citizenship. <laughs> 
Despite holding, quote, our fathers, and here the son of John Jay was speaking literally, guilty of the constitutional compromises over slavery, the three-fifths clause, the fugitive slave clause, and the clause delaying the abolition of the African slave trade to 1808. He argued that the Constitution recognized no differences based on color. But the federal government, quote, oppress and degrade the free people of color. He noted with its racist citizenship and militia laws that were passed in the 1790s. It had used its powers in particular to debase the free black population of the district with a host of petty restrictions and aided slaveholders, quote, in trampling upon those great principles of human rights by operating on the assumption that all free blacks in the District of Columbia were fugitive slaves. Jay listed the names and stories of blacks held in DC prisons and at times sold because they had no slaveholding claimant. So here are abolitionists beginning the idea that if emancipation has to come about in the country, it must begin with the capital, with Washington DC and through the action of the federal government and that it should guarantee black rights. Domestically and internationally, the US government, Jay accused, acted as the handmaiden of slavery, violating constitutionally guaranteed rights of citizens, upholding the domestic slave trade and slavery, refusing to recognize, quote, the heroic Republic of Haiti, which of course the Lincoln administration would eventually recognize, same year as DC emancipation, warring against the Seminoles in Florida, demanding rendition of fugitive slaves and compensation for slave rebels who made their way to the British West Indies, tolerating an illegal African slave trade, infringements on civil liberties and freedom of speech of abolitionists and African-Americans in the South and plotting to annex Texas. Implicit in Jay's argument was the notion that Northerners should redeem the federal government from being a tool of slaveholders. The rapid sale of his pamphlet led to a second edition in 1844. In a companion pamphlet on the condition of the free people of color, Jay listed the disabilities on black citizenship in the slaveholding republic. The lack of quote, elective franchise, denial of rights of locomotion, impediments to education, susceptibility to enslavement, and, quote, subjection to insult and outrage, by which he meant racism. The federal government not only sustained, but subsidized slavery, reimbursing its functionaries, particularly army officers in the frontiers, which is where the Dred Scott case actually emerges, for employing slave labor. With good reason, abolitionists and anti-slavery politicians made redeeming the federal government from the clutches of, quote, the slave power, their highest priority. Now, unlike Weld and Jay, who did not challenge the constitutional consensus that the federal government had no right to interfere with Southern slavery, that is slavery in the Southern states. It could act in federal territories like DC, but it could not interfere in Southern slavery. Most Northern states had passed state laws for emancipation. Some Liberty Party constitutionalists went further. Now the Liberty Party was an abolitionist party founded in the 1840s. And one of its founders was Alvin Stewart, a lawyer from New York. Now, Alvin Stewart argued that the Constitution's guarantees of citizenship, which were violated by slavery, allowed the federal government to abolish slavery directly in the Southern states. He pronounced slavery unconstitutional on the basis of the Fifth Amendment, which stipulated that no person could be deprived of life, liberty, and property without the due process of law. And that would, in fact, be the article that would be nationalized in the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution after the Civil War. Now, in, quote, a constitutional argument on the subject of slavery, Stewart urged that the federal government 
or to abolish slavery in order to fulfill the constitutional guarantee of Republican government in the Southern states, that is a representative form of government in the Southern states and in accordance with general welfare. And in fact, that would be the constitutional clause that Republicans would use during reconstruction after the Civil War to ensure black rights in the former Confederate states. Now, Stewart died in 1849, and though Free Soilers rejected his constitutional views, he influenced radical political abolitionists such as Garrett Smith, William Goodell, and after his break with the Garrisonians, Frederick Douglass. Now, the emergence of political abolitionism represented by the Liberty Party forced Garrison and his allies to develop their own stance on politics often mischaracterized as an outdated adherence to moral suasion, meaning morally persuading slaveholders to give up slavery, or as a political. Rejecting electoral politics, Garrisonians developed the politics of agitation. The fugitive slave controversy played a huge role in Garrison's rejection of what he called a pro-slavery union and constitution. And he is, of course, pictured at the bottom right. In 1842, Chief Justice Joseph Story in the Supreme Court case, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, declared Northern personal liberty laws, these were state laws that gave free blacks and suspected fugitives certain legal protections, due process and trial by jury unconstitutional, meaning it violated the fugitive slave clause of the US Constitution. That year, Garrison announced his doctrine in The Liberator, quote, a repeal of the union between Northern liberty and Southern slavery is essential to the abolition of one and preservation of the other. For Garrisonians, this doctrine was a concerted attack on slaveholders' political power and not a retreat into inaction. By 1844, the official policy of the garrison-led American Anti-Slavery Society became, quote, no union with slaveholders. The union, Garrison pointed out in his, quote, an address to the Friends of Freedom and Emancipation in the United States was bought, quote, at the expense of the colored population of the country. Garrison object expected uh, opposition at so bold and revolutionary a step but argued that in advocating it, the American Anti-Slavery Society had taken the highest possible ground against slavery. No compromise with slaveholders and slavery. Garrison's inspiration for his condemnation of the Constitution as pro-slavery lay close to home. Now, unknown to historians, and this was one of my aha moments when I was writing my book on abolition, Garrison derived his famous indictment of the Constitution as, quote, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell from the Black abolitionist, Reverend James W.C. Pennington, pictured here on the top. Uh, Pennington was a clergyman, and it made sense to me because Garrison was not known for quoting the Bible. Uh, but certainly clergymen like Pennington based their ideas on the word of the Bible. In 1842, at the height of the controversy of the fugitive slave George Latimer in Massachusetts, Pennington delivered a sermon to his Hartford congregation. Covenants involving moral wrong are not obligatory upon man, which began with a quotation from the book of Isaiah, quote, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. Now, Pennington argued that, quote, laws and compacts designed to legalize the system of human bondage, like the constitutional obligation to deliver up fugitive slaves, ought to be swept away as they, dis they, as they involved disobedience to God. Pennington evoked a higher law, long before it became popular with anti-slavery politicians like William Seward after the Compromise of 1850. Pennington, who ironically was associated with the Tappanite wing of the abolition movement that was anti-Garrisonian, used that characterization for the Fugitive Slave Clause of the US Constitution and the Federal Fugitive Slave Law. 
a fugitive slave himself, Pennington was a self-educated clergyman, teacher, and abolitionist known for his erudition. He became the first African-American to be awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg in 1849. In fact, in 2011, the University of Heidelberg instituted a fellowship in his name in commemoration of his 625th anniversary for which President Obama sent his felicitations and for which I have the honor to deliver the inaugural address. Now, Ken Garrison extended Pennington's biblical indictment of the fugitive slave clause and the federal fugitive slave law to the entire constitution. Garrisonians and political abolitionists, <clears throat> excuse me, stances on the nature of the constitution developed in response to each other. In 1844, Wendell Phillips, a lawyer by training, presented the full-blown Garrisonian argument in the Constitution, a pro-slavery compact. Phillips went beyond the specific constitutional clauses dealing with slavery, though he listed them all. Mining James Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention debates, which were published for the first time in 1840, he tried to prove the intent of the framers to protect slavery. Phillips concluded that the Constitution, quote, was an infamous bargain that proved the melancholy fact that our fathers bartered honesty for gain and became partners with tyrants that they might profit from their tyranny, a radical abolitionist indictment of their sacrosanct liberty-loving reputation. His pamphlet, though, began with a quotation from John Quincy Adams, who, of course, had presented abolition petitions in Congress uh, when he was elected as a congressman from Massachusetts after his presidency. And this quotation was that the very purposes of the national government had been prostituted for the protection and preservation of slavery. And he conceded the argument of political abolitionists that the constitution had been put to increasingly pro-slavery use by uh, planter politicians like Calhoun over the years. But for Phillips, the constitution in its original form as is was also pro-slavery. A year later in Can Abolitionists Vote or Take Office under the United States Constitution, Phillips argued that the American Anti-Slavery Society's opposition to a pro-slavery government and laws should not be mistaken as endorsing a no government or non-resistant position which Garrison supported. Phillips argued that he had simply judged all institutions and documents, no matter, quote, how venerable, by the touchstone of anti-slavery principle and found them wanting. The American Anti-Slavery Society published an expanded version of his pamphlet with an endorsement from its executive committee. It went through three editions, meriting a response from the political abolitionists associated with the Liberty Party. Now, William Goodell's views of American constitutional law at, in its bearing upon American slavery, which was published in 1844, and he's pictured here on your right, and Massachusetts law, lawyer Lysander Spooner pictured on the left, his The Constitu Unconstitutionality of Slavery, published in 1845, were the most detailed expositions of the political abolitionist position. Goodell's treaties began with the deceptively simple premise that the American government and constitution cannot be viewed as, quote, neutral or even partial on the subject of slavery. It must either be completely for or against liberty, as even a slight toleration of slavery would endanger all liberty. If it was pro-slavery, as the Garrisonians argued, then indeed the abolitionists had the right to revolution or submission. But he argued that the slaveholders pro-slavery reading of the constitution was based on their complete rejection of democracy and representative government, their defense of slavery and their contempt for the laboring masses, black and white. He refuted it with their own principle of strict construction arguing that the constitution did not recognize slavery since slavery reduced human beings to chattel property, things, and the constitution only alluded to persons, persons held to servitude. 
For Goodell, anti-slavery was bound up with the development of human freedom and republicanism that is representative government in the Anglo-American world. The democratic spirit of the constitution with its positive exhortations on liberties and rights, like that of the English common law, the declaration, and he even put in the New Testament, which also did not exclude specific abolitionist injunctions were anti-slavery. According to Goodell, all anti-slavery men need not be Republicans, meaning need not believe in democracy and representative government, but all those who did must be anti-slavery. His was the radical democratic interpretation that privileged ideas over the facts unearthed by Phillips. In a public letter to John G. Whittier, Gareth Smith also called the Constitution, quote, a noble and beautiful temple of liberty based on the defense of human rights that had simply been perverted to pro-slavery ends. Even the three-fifths clause, Smith argued, could not prevent a Northern majority from voting in an anti-slavery government, which is of course precisely what happened when Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860. Similarly, according to Spooner, all law, especially constitutional law, must be based on principles of natural rights and justice. The fact that the African slave trade and slavery were tolerated in the American colonies was no argument for their legality. Also making a historical argument, Spooner wrote that slavery was not recognized in either the state constitutions or the Articles of Confederation that had preceded the U.S. Constitution, and if slavery did not have, quote, a constitutional existence earlier, it certainly did not under the U.S. Constitution, which recognized all people, including Blacks, as citizens. Like Goodell, Spooner argued that the Constitution recognized only persons, not chattels personal, persons held to service referred to servants, not slaves. Furthermore, the preamble referred to all the people of the United States, not just whites or free people as citizens of the country. The only guarantee in the Constitution concerned not slavery, despite the quote, arrogant and bombastic claims of slaveholders, but a representative form of government, which slavery contravened. Spooner concluded that the anti-slavery nature of the constitution guaranteed that all the children of slaves were born free and ought to be freed immediately by federal judges. Now Phillips, Goodell's and Spooner's beliefs were dangerous for abolitionist activists as they denied the possibility that governments and laws could be unjust. Abolitionists might as well bury their heads in the sand and wait for the law and the constitution to work out their destiny. And of course, this was a time when slavery was not declining, it was expanding voraciously and was extremely profitable. In his 1847 review of Spooner's book, Phillips proceeded to dismantle each one of his historical and constitutional arguments, but ended with genuine admiration for their quote ingenuity. In the constitutional debate, both sides did the other a disservice. While political abolitionists sought to harness the power of the federal government for abolition, Garrisonians were far from simply endorsing the pro-slavery constitutional argument of Calhounites, but were asking for the revolutionary remaking of the US Constitution, which is precisely what happened during the Civil War and Reconstruction with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the US Constitution. Now, Goodell recognized that despite their constitutional quibbles, abolitionists shared enough common ground to recommend unity of purpose. Now, political abolitionists were more interested in dismantling slaveholders, especially Calhounians, uh, extreme pro-slavery constitutional claims than simply sparring with the Garrisonians. As in biblical interpretation, while slaveholders championed a literal and strict construction of the constitution, abolitionists appealed to its liberal spirit. Now, anti-slavery constitutional theory emerged from this rich and long abolitionist debate on the relationship of slavery to the constitution. And some of you might be aware that historians and lawyers 
are still debating this, the relationship of slavery to the, to the original US Constitution. Now, among abolitionists, there was no consensus on this debate, but anti-slavery politicians were able to distill the most effective political and constitutional anti-slavery strategy from the abolitionist debate, sure to appeal to the largest numbers of Northern voters. They built on the political abolitionist idea that slavery was the creature of positive state law and in contravention to the common law, English common law, the declaration and the constitution. But they dropped the abolitionist insistence on black citizenship and abolition in the Southern states. So they were accepting the Garrisonian idea that the constitution actually protected slavery in the Southern states. The person who best developed what he called constitutional anti-slavery was the Ohio lawyer and politician, Salmon P. Chase, pictured here on the right. Now Chase joined the Liberty Party, the abolitionist party in 1841, and became an advocate of broadening its appeal in the North. He used abolitionist ideas to reassure Northerners of the constitutionally legitimate nature of the anti-slavery political project unlike most political abolitionists and conceding considerable ground to the Garrisonians, he argued that the constitution protected slavery in the Southern states, but that the founding principles of the country were anti-slavery and visualized an end to slavery. The constitution gave full powers and in fact made it the duty of the federal government to act against slavery in areas under it. The District of Columbia, the federal territories in the West, um, the interstate slave trade, the domestic slave trade, and the fugitive slave clause. Chase's notion of the divorce of the federal government from slavery became incorporated into the Liberty Party platform of 1844, and his slogan, quote, the denationalization of slavery became the rallying cry of the Free Soil Party that was founded four years later during the Mexican War, when there was an outcry in the North against the expansion of slavery uh, into the Southwest and against the Mexican war, war. In fact, Abraham Lincoln began his political career in nationally as an anti-war politician. He opposed the Mexican war as a land grab for slavery. It was perhaps fit that this adept theorist of anti-slavery constitutionalism succeeded Roger Tawney, the avatar of pro-slavery constitutionalism, author of the Dred Scott decision, as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was appointed by Lincoln. But another person who was really important in developing this idea that the federal government should use all its powers to act against slavery was Charles Sumner. And his idea was Freedom National. And he opposed the federal fugitive slave law, the draconian one of 1850, as unconstitutional, as unconstitutional. He said that the federal government should not be protecting slavery, should not be uh, helping in the rendition of fugitive slaves. He always called it a bill because he said it was unconstitutional. Sumner was an abolitionist, um, believer in black equality, and his notion of freedom national also worked, played a big part in um, creating the platform of the new anti-slavery Republican party that was founded in the 1850s. Uh, these two men were radicals, but they were also founders of the Republican party. But the last word on anti-slavery constitutionalism belongs to the great black abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. In 1851, Douglass had announced his conversion from the Garrisonian doctrine that the constitution was pro-slavery to the argument that it was anti-slavery and required political action by the federal government against slavery. Douglass gained a much needed infusion of funds for his newspaper, from the old Liberty Party paper and from the black abolitionist Samuel Ringgold Ward's impartial citizen. Again, showing that black citizenship was an important part of the abolitionist platform, something that Republicans would implement with the 14th and 15th amendments to the US Constitution after the Civil War. Now, like Garrett Smith, 
Douglas adhered to abolitionist rather than anti-slavery constitutional theory, meaning he thought the federal government should go ahead and abolish slavery in the southern states, but he also supported free soil politics. He argued that the federal government actually could do all these things under the U.S. Constitution. Now, like most political abolitionists, Douglas combined a literal reading of the nation's founding legal document, stressing that neither slavery nor slaves was specifically mentioned in it, with the abolitionist insistence that constitutional guarantees of citizenship rights, the first 10 amendments, included African Americans. He went further. The original intent of its framers, many of whom he well knew were slaveholders, Douglas implied was irrelevant. This claim was bold in the context of 19th century American constitutionalism, when both slaveholding Southern and anti-slavery Northern politicians regularly sought to enforce the founders on their side of the sectional conflict. Anticipating modern constitutional theorists, Douglas argued that the Constitution was a living document whose democratic promise must be extended by subsequent generations. As he put it in his speech, which was published in 1860, the Constitution of the United States is it pro-slavery or anti-slavery. Slaveholders had given the U.S. Constitution, quote, a pro-slavery interpretation, but the Constitution, quote, will afford slavery no protection when it shall cease to be administered by slaveholders. The real purpose of abolitionist constitutionalism was not to simply stay true to the original intent of its framers, as pro-slavery literalists and strict constructionists argued, but to use it for anti-slavery purpose. Douglas did invoke the founding generation and their ideals, but in the matter of constitutional interpretation, he asked his and future generations to imagine black citizenship. By refusing to be held hostage, to the original intent of the constitutional frame, uh, constitution's framers, Douglas went well beyond contemporary co constitutional debates over slavery and anticipated its remaking during the Civil War and after the war. He imagined an interracial democracy in the United States and the overthrow of the Lily White slaveholding republic, an abolitionist goal that radical Republicans sought to achieve during Reconstruction. Now, in the end, both the Garrisonians and political abolitionists were proven right. Slavery was abolished through state action, but in the midst of the enormous bloodletting of the Civil War, a covenant with death indeed. Excuse me. Now, for long abolitionists, like 20th century political theorists, had debated whether the American government was created as, quote, a tool of the, quote, slave power, or whether it was in an arena of conflict, susceptible to anti-slavery influence. Now, despite their differences on the nature of the Union and Constitution, for abolitionists and radical Republicans, anti-slavery was the dominant principle of their politics. Now, Lincoln's position, on the other hand, represented that of a majority of anti-slavery moderates in the Republican Party. Lincoln's competing loyalties to the Union and Constitution had moderated his anti-slavery beliefs through much of his political career. For most anti-slavery moderates like Lincoln, the Union, the Constitution, and anti-slavery represented dissonant, competing political loyalties. The slaveholders' rebellion solved that problem for him. During the revolutionary crisis generated by Southern secession and civil war, Lincoln's competing political loyalties became compatible. The war allowed a majority of Northerners to align their commitment to the Union, and most importantly for lawyers like Lincoln, to the Constitution with emancipation in the rebel states. And it's the reason why Congress and Lincoln went ahead with compensated emancipation and colonization for D.C., because this was still under the federal government 
And he had this plan also for the border slave states that stayed in the Union, Maryland, Delaware, uh, Kentucky, Missouri, though they all rejected his plan. Uh, and when he did employ his war powers to issue the Emancipation Proclamation uh, for those areas that were under re uh, in rebellion against the government of the United States, he invoked John Quincy Adams, and Adams' notion of using his war powers constitutionally to abolish slavery. So Lincoln moved on emancipation in DC in the border slave states one way and in another way for the states under rebellion. And the reason why he of course did this was because of the differing status of these places. One were these one area was under the union, the other was not. The most African-Americans and abolitionists viewed DC emancipation as a portent. And they recognized that this would lead to emancipation in the country as a whole, which in fact it did by January 1st, 1863. And then of course, with the 13th amendment to the US constitution that Lincoln advocated towards the end of his life. So abolitionist constitutional thought based on a vindication of black citizenship rights. This is important. Abolitionists were not just fighting for an end to slavery. They were fighting for equal black rights. And that's what made them radical and distinguished them from men who were merely anti-slavery in sentiment. All this bore fruit during the crisis of the union. When Lincoln abandoned colonization, which he had advocated before the war and endorsed limited black male suffrage before his death, he inhabited abolitionist ground. The agenda of reconstruction fueled by the refusal of former slaves and Confederates to accept the results of emancipation. Andrew Johnson's restoration policies after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln had long all these ideas that we must implement black rights, voting and office holding as viewed here in this picture of the first black congressman uh, during reconstruction, all these ideas had roots in abolitionist constitutionalism. For it to triumph fully, new federal laws guaranteeing black civil rights had to be passed. Remember the first civil rights laws, national civil rights laws in this country were not passed during the civil rights movement, but in the 19th century in 1866 and later, and the constitution would have to be remade with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. Uh, the 14th amendment, which nationalized the bill of rights and gave national birthright citizenship, regardless of race, color or previous condition of servitude. The fight for black citizenship propelled American state formation during Reconstruction. Until today, reinforced by events of the civil rights movement of the 20th century, what people call the second Reconstruction of American democracy, the black view of the federal government as the guardian of citizenship rights stands in glaring contrast to conservatives' anti-status or anti-big government states' rights views. After 1877, the romance of reunion and a narrow misreading of the reconstruction laws and amendments by the United States Supreme Court that brazenly flouted the intent of their Republican lawmakers would once again eclipse abolitionist principle. But it had been the long abolitionist fight for human rights and black citizenship under the US Constitution that flowered during Reconstruction. Its promise cut short by racial terror, disfranchisement, segregation, and debt peonage that made a mockery of black freedom, and that unfortunately the United States Supreme Court uh, agreed by uh, in its famous, or rather infamous, Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896, but much of that retreat was already put into place by the US Supreme Court uh, starting in the 1870s. So thank you so much for listening to me so patiently. I know that was a, a fairly long talk and a detailed one. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and I would be happy to, to take any questions or comments um, that the audience might have. Thank you very much, Manisha. That was a fascinating uh, recitation of the stream 
various streams of thought that went into uh, the river uh, to, uh, uh, for abolition. Uh, it was fascinating, the, the various schools of thought. I had a couple of questions have come in and, and I had a, a couple myself. Uh, William Jay related, it was Chief Justice John Jay's son. Where was he a judge? He was a state judge in New York. State judge in New York, okay. Yeah, but he was an abolitionist and uh, a believer, not only, as I said, in, in, in ending slavery, but also in, in black rights, in black yes. rights, which was unusual in the 19th century. Yes, yes. And, and uh, a question from the audience, how did uh, William Jay's views on slavery differ, if they did, from his father's? That's a very good question. Um, there's a good new book on the Jay family. John Jay is interesting. The Jay family is interesting. Like many of the Northern founding fathers, um, not all of them, John Adams wasn't a slaveholder, but Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, uh, their families actually owned enslaved people. Uh, but when the Northern states moved towards gradual emancipation, they divested themselves of the enslaved people. And John Jay was actually governor of New York and he pushed for gradual emancipation in the state of New York. So, you know, we have these very um, polarized views of the founders, right? One was, oh, they were all slaveholders and horrible. And the other was, oh, they were all these liberty loving mythic figures. And actually the truth is somewhere in the middle because you can find many of the Northern founding fathers including Benjamin Franklin, Alexander, Hamilton, John Jay, who lend the prestige of their names to the first abolition societies in this country. So John Jay did with the New York Manumission Society, Alexander Hamilton did. Uh, also Benjamin Franklin became president of the Pennsylvania, the famous Pennsylvania Abolition Society. So there was a sectional divide, you could say, on the question of slavery right from the start. Um, and uh, some of the so Southern founding fathers um, even though they express anti-slavery sentiment, their actions were pro-slavery, took, took advantage fully of enslaved people. Um, the, the one exception of, is of course, George Washington who did free his slaves um, when he died. But, but the Jay family is an interesting uh, family in, in the sense that it tells us a little bit about how this family evolved from this initial anti-slavery position of John Jay to the abolitionist position of William Jay, who was also uh, the president of the American Peace Society, who was a pacifist, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and his sons who became abolitionist lawyers and fought for abolition and black rights. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice saga of um, a commitment to anti-slavery principle. Thank you. I, you mentioned a book that has been recently written about the Jay family. Did, did you yes. name the book? Uh, yes, it's it's David Galman's book. I actually blurbed it, but for some reason the title escapes me right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. But he's he written a, a book on the Jay family where he deals with with complex questions. You know, bringing to light that that you know many of these people were slave owners too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how they had to divest themselves of slaveholding before they could move on to anti-slavery positions. Because people forget, of course, that slavery was legal throughout in all the 13 colonies on the eve of the revolution. Yes. The yes. Years after, you know, it's in the early Republic that we get that. Um, yes. No. No. Um, I was interested in, in, in the Garrisonian and Goodell viewpoints about the Constitution being in, in essence, a pro-slavery uh, document and, and the rejection in it, as I, maybe I read more into your comments than it, that it was intended, but it seemed to me that they, they were uh, sort of advocating the, the uh, uh, tossing aside the constitution and starting over. Maybe that's going a bit too far, but how did they reconcile um, and, ex or did they, and, and did they ultimately accept the Constitution is a valid document when it was amended um, on, on the on these issues of slavery. Uh, did they, um, at that point in time, uh, finally embrace the Constitution as, in essence, a valid document under which we uh, continue to live, or were they still rejecting the document post amendments? <laughs> 
Now, that's a big question. You know, my first book was on um, Southern constitutional theory and mm -hmm. state rights and, and pro-slavery arguments, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, put forward by people like Calhoun and, and the South Carolinians. And they really felt that they had the Constitution on their side. Uh, they rarely refer to the Declaration of Independence. In fact, they were not too fond of it because of its ringing endorsement of universal human equality, but very legalistically, very strictly, they were looking at the US US Constitution and saying that, oh, it protects slavery. But of course, they went far beyond the word of the Constitution, too. I mean, Calhoun invents nullification and secession, and he says, oh, that's guaranteed by the Tenth Amendment. You know, there's still people who are running around today who believe that ridiculous idea, but that was not in the written word of the Constitution at all. And luckily, James Madison was alive, and he said, Calhoun's talking nonsense. We never meant to. Uh, uh, say that 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 nullification and secession are constitutional rights given to states. Um, these are revolutionary rights, and these are not in the U.S. Constitution. So both sides went far beyond the written word of the Constitution. It is true that unlike the Garrisonians, who went very strictly according to the word of the Constitution, and what bothered the Garrisonians, like the Federalists were really angry with the Three-Fifths Clause, so they kept losing elections because Southern slave owners just had so much more political power because of the three flip fifths clause. Their slaves were represented and they got extra political power. They dominated the presidency, the US Supreme Court, uh, Congress, the Senate, particularly because of that. Um, but um, what, what's, what's interesting is that for Garrisonians, the, the clause that they mainly objected to was the fugitive slave clause. Mm -hmm. They're trying to say that this is this is destroying Northern freedom. This is destroying the freedom principle in the North. Uh, we can't implement Northern rights, Northern states' rights, Northern rights to have freedom on our soil. Uh, we must render fugitive slaves back. Um, and that's why Garrison rejects the US Constitution as a covenant with debt because, he, because of all the fugitive slave controversies occurring in the 1850s. Uh, he famously burns a copy of the fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the U.S. Constitution, and uh, the decision of a commissioner remanding the fugitive slave Anthony Burns back to the South. But what political abolitionists are doing is they're going far beyond the word of the Constitution. You're right. But they're seeing the Constitution as they called it a liberty document. And they're looking at the first 10 amendments and they're saying this applies to all Black people, even to enslaved people. Now, of course, there are there. I saw in the QA, there are many decisions that are made in the federal courts and the US Supreme Court that goes against all this, but they're not interested in the legal precedent. They are arguing as abolitionists, as activists, that we should use the first 10 amendments for anti slavery purpose. So Alvin Stewart dies, but many of them are alive when the 14th Amendment is passed. And when mm -hmm. John Bingham famously calls the first 10 amendments Bill of Rights, it was not even called Bill of Rights before that. It's the author of the 14th Amendment that gives that moniker to the first ten, to the first eight amendments that we use today, the Bill of Rights. Um, all political abolitionists feel vindicated. They feel, oh, that's exactly what we've been saying all mm -hmm. this time, and now that has been nationalized. So the Garrisonians too feel vindicated. They said, well, but you have to re you have to have an amendment to make that clear, right? Right. right. In a way. What I'm trying to argue is that the anti-slavery politics and jurisprudence that comes out during the Civil War and Reconstruction is very shaped by these abolitionist debates over the nature of the U.S. Constitution. This is fascinating, and, and you have done a splendid job. I think you've anticipated the last uh, couple of questions that we had and, 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 uh, um, and answered those as well in your thorough uh, review of this. Uh, Professor Sina, I thank you very, very much for, for your time today and your taking time away from your busy schedule. Uh, it's been a, a, a real gem of a lecture and uh, on quite an appropriate day. Our uh, society, uh, our gift shop uh, in the Supreme Court has copies of your book, The Slaves cause, which is available, and I highly recommend it to all our listeners. Um, and we have several more virtual programs coming up, I'd like to announce. Next Thursday, April 27th, 
uh, at noon, I will be joined by Peter Canellos uh, for discussion of his uh, book, biography, The Great Dissenter, uh, biography of first John Marshall Harlan. And uh, you alluded to Plessy versus Ferguson and his lone dissent uh, uh, today, Professor. So we'll go into that in some more detail uh, next uh, Thursday, April 27th. Uh, on Tuesday, May uh, 2nd, again at noon, Professor John McHale will be joining us for a Law Day lecture on James Wilson and We the People. Registration for both events are open and available on the Society's website. Uh, a reminder that a survey will go out later this afternoon to everyone who registered in advance. Please do respond to the survey. We want to make these programs as interesting and accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, Manisha, thank you so much again for being with us today. And Congratulations to your University of Connecticut uh, men's basketball team, their national champions. That must make you happy. And they uh, replaced yeah. the women. The women are usually the national champions from Connecticut, yeah. but uh, this year the men won. Thank you. Uh, we were hoping that, you know, we would get both of them to win the national yeah, it was, it was, very nice, but I think I've jinxed the women's team ever since I started teaching at UConn in 2000. <laughs> we haven't won. I hope that's not me acting as a judge. That, yes. Well, well uh, you, you brought good luck to the men. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's been fascinating, educational, important, and we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're adjourned.